This is a story of brotherhood, redemption, and one hell of a time for 50 platoon soldiers in the summer of 1979. Boys grew to men, and men to leaders. It was a test of skills, determination, and teamwork. In 1979, Americans were reeling from the long Vietnam War that ended in 73, and U.S. military enlistment was at an all-time low. Due to this, criminals had two options, go to jail or enlist in the military in an attempt to fill up the ranks. However, this was creating a weaker military by accepting substandard soldiers. The Army needed to attract better and more educated soldiers to run the advanced weapons being developed. To do so, they were forced to offer enlistment bonuses, such as paying for college tuition. Raise your right hand and repeat after me the oath of enlistment. I I do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will support. This attracted the role of Jim Murphy, who became the recruiter for the National Guard in a small town in Lexington, Nebraska, and had the local nickname Big Jim. Big Jim. Big Jim. Big Jim had the nickname Big Jim because he was a big square guy, just like a Nebraska lineman. He was the captain of the team as a lineman, which is hard to do. He was also an Army Ranger. So an Army Ranger is like a Navy SEAL for the Army, and they, they're the elite of the elite in the Army. You know, he, he was a guy that was a great dad, he was very supportive, but he was also a guy that had a command voice. When he said you did something, you just did it. So he had to go to the regular Army, which didn't always think that highly of the National Guard and talk them into allowing us to complete our basic and AIT all at the same time. One station unit training is what it was called. In fact, I think they named it after Big Jim did this. This would allow the regular Army to see how the Nebraska unit with college incentive stacked up with the five other regular Army platoons. So they decided to accept Big Jim's idea. They made it clear to Big Jim that if any of the Nebraska platoon did not pass the tests, they would be recycled and would miss college. No exceptions. Only boys could join combat units back in 1979, and Big Jim had three of his own. He brought Dan and Joe and I, the three boys, into a room and said, OK, I don't have enough money to pay for everyone to go to college, so you boys are going to have to figure out a way to pay for part of your college. And you can either join the Army or you can join the National Guard. It was almost like an Amway salesman, you know, that, you know, every two that you got to sign up, you got an extra stripe. And so Big Jim got uh, Little Jim and, and Dan and, and Joe, and then they just recruited the rest of us. So He didn't say no to Big Jim, so when, uh, when he got a hold of us and, and uh, started talking to you, it was pretty much a done deal, really. I mean, he was, yeah. a, hell of, he was a hell of a salesman. Yes, he was. And Jim Murphy had the vision to you know, put together this this whole Nebraska platoon. I think he was the author of it, but uh, hindsight, what a wonderful thing, I mean. I didn't really know what I wanted to do the rest of my life and uh, wanted to, to get out of COZAD and, and that was a fast way to do it. Um, thanks, Big Jim. <laughs> my parents, like most parents in Lexington, could not afford to help me pay for college and the National Guard made that dream come true for me. Um, the chance to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky with guys who I grew up with was once in a lifetime event for me. These were the guys I went to school with, I went to church with, I played sports with, was in boxing clubs with. Big Jim always believed that if your country were to help you with college, you must first do something to help it. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Well, honestly, it was a pretty darn good deal. And uh, it didn't take a whole lot of coaxing. If you're gonna do something, do it with your friends. Three-fourths of your college tuition, it was kind of a no-brainer back then. I got a call from my dad, I was in my finishing my first year of law school, and he said, Jim Murphy's gonna call you, and he's got a good idea, you probably ought to say yes, but it's up to you. But it pays for a lot of your tuition, but it's up to you. 
and he might have said that three more times. <laughs> sounded like a good idea because it sounded like something other than law school. So I was a pretty easy sell too. Joe, if I was you, I probably would have regretted that decision. I didn't. No, I was <laughs> <laughs> Big Jim had done the impossible of filling up an entire state quota as one recruiter. The goal was eight boys and he signed up 50. It was time to head to Fort Knox, Kentucky and see how the Big Red Platoon matched up. We all climbed on that C-130 plane and it was in Kearney, Nebraska. And we, we got off two and a half hours later in Fort Knox, Kentucky. A short flight and, and through the reception, we had our haircuts. Uh, a lot of us had hair at that time. That's kind of how we started because the shots were one of the first well, things that we had to do. So. Yeah, the shots were one of the worst. And then <laughs> we get the shots, get our hair buzzed off, get our uniforms. And we have to go on a, what was it, like a five or seven mile hike yeah. in brand new boots. Yeah. And everybody is just yeah. sick and full of blisters <laughs> and it was horrible. My most memorable moment was the gas chamber. And uh, it was my favorite day because it was kind of a mind deal and they wanted to get you used to knowing that your gas mask worked. But people would come out of there crying and snot would be running down their nose and uh, the light would be hitting you in the eyes and it was just fun to watch. Remember the, remember the guy that ran down the hill and ran smack dab into the tree? Yeah, and then I think there was another one that everybody was laughing and then little Jim saved him just before. Yeah. The young men would also be introduced to their drill sergeants, Sergeant Kirk and Sergeant Gwell. I would say that Sergeant Kirk was more uh, of a mentor, kind of teacher, coach. Uh, that's what the senior drill sergeant is supposed to be. And drill sergeant Grill, Gwill was supposed to be the tougher, um, tough love kind of uh, drill sergeant. Out of all the instructors we could ever get in Fort Knox, I mean, we really, really liked that. We got two, two outstanding guys. Uh, drill sergeant Kirk, or Gwill, I mean, he liked to run it's a guy who could drink or smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and drink a case of Coke and he still run like 10, 12 miles without stopping. So. Remember that first day we got off the bus? Oh, yeah. Take your shit in, boys. We're going to go for a run. And shit, half of us beat him, so I think he decided maybe he didn't need to run us near as much. <laughs> They're both Kentucky bred uh, hillbillies that uh, were out there to, to shape young men into real men. And so uh, we were fortunate to have who we had. And, I think they were really glad that they had who they had too, so because when, uh, when we left, you could tell on their faces and stuff that we meant a lot to them. So. Every individual soldier and every platoon as a whole were graded on every training exercise. PT was the majority of all early testing, from two mile runs to monkey bars and obstacle courses. Everything deemed a grade, all while the drill sergeants mentally tried to break down every soldier, pushing them to their limits. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Most of the other platoons had recruits dropping like flies, but the Nebraska boys were all excelling. After the first two weeks, the first platoon had earned the drill sergeant's respect and won 10 out of 10 on the PT scoring. Training continued, and so did the Nebraska boys' domination in achieving number one spots compared to the rest of the platoon. I think one of the reasons the Nebraska platoon was so successful was that we learned early on, um, one of the ways that the military trains you is, one fail, you all fail. We were the best at everything, whether it was PT, marksmanship, weapons, radio drills, skills, whatever it was, we ended up winning everything. And part of that winning attitude came from we wanted to be the best. We took care of each other, whether it was making our beds, spit shining our boots, Whatever it was, if we had somebody that knew how to do it better and faster, that he showed the rest of us how to do it, and we worked together as a team. We knew what our purpose was, and that was to be the best that we could be while we were there. We wanted to make Big Jim proud of us, our families to be proud of what we've done. And so we were shooting for the honor platoon from the day we got there. With that made us, we kind of had a target on our back. A lot of animosity that you know, really coveted, you know, how do we do this? All these guys are going home. They're gonna go through basic, they're gonna go through advanced individual training, AIT, and they're going home. 
you know, they're going to serve in their communities. They're going to do one, you know, one week in a month. They're going to do two weeks active duty. The young fellow in the uh, other platoon on a camp out got angry and put a M16 at my head. We didn't think it was loaded, but you don't want to get too risky there. Very rude. Isn't it? Very rude. Very rude. Yeah. Jenkins. Um, Private Jenkins was the guy's name. Just Jenkins. get that out there. Yeah, exactly. And if he's out there, I want you to know that was a rude You want thing. a piece of him. We did want a, a rude thing to that guy. <laughs> but I just, Jenkins. I would have no idea which federal prison he's been in all these years. Yeah. <laughs> the other platoons were ready to beat the Nebraska boys on something they felt they had a level playing field weapons training. You know, they, they didn't know that the Nebraska guys, we all grew up hunting, right? We, we were shooting shotguns at ducks and pheasant and geese since we were 10 years old, right? So we knew how to break down weapons, we knew how to clean weapons, we knew how to sight weapons. So when it came to weapons training, you know, they got waxed even worse than they did in the, in the other uh, tests. By the time the weapons training was over, the Nebraska platoon had won all 11 weapons contests. The platoon had finished the basic training part of the summer, and the Nebraska boys were still undefeated. The other platoons had to change their goal from winning honor platoon to winning something far more physical. There was one night where a group of guys were coming back from the enlisted club, and a large group of soldiers from other platoons jumped them and cheap shot at them. And when they got back and told us about it, we decided that we were going to show that we were uh, of quality, I guess I would say. So we went to the enlisted club that night, and I think it was uh, Dan Murphy let a couple of them know that we were not happy about the incident that happened prior to, and that we were willing to follow up on it if they wanted to. Well, when we got outside, it was pretty evident that the numbers were not equal, but at that point we didn't really care. We were there to prove that we were Huskers. So once we got outside, we were outnumbered, but we had all our red shirts on. And what happens in a lot of, you know, fights is when the first couple of guys go down, sometimes a lot of other guys didn't want to get in. So that's what happened. Nebraska boys uh, won, the, won the fight, but we lost the battle because here came the MPs. Pretty soon, a bunch of the Nebraska boys were handcuffed and on the way to the brig, me included. And even though that was an un unfortunate incident, it did put the other platoons on notice. You mess with one guy in red, you're going to get 50 guys coming your direction. <laughs> and then Will telling us that, yeah, he might not graduate. Really? Right. <laughs> so then he also said, uh, next time you guys go in one of your t-shirts, let me know, I'll bring mine in and we'll all go together. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's great. Idea. The part I love best about this story, though, is four or five days later when everything calmed down, the other drill sergeants all had to go off and take about a 10-minute meeting. And Dan Larson went over to the head guy of the second platoon, which was a guy named Robert Johnson. He went over to him and said no in certain terms, your guys won't be jumping our guys ever again. And this guy made the mistake of telling Larson, you know what, we'll do what we want when we want. Dan Larson, who was a college wrestler, had this guy down on the ground in like about a half a second. It looked like Dan Larson had three arms somehow. And this guy was in serious pain until he basically tapped out. Dan helps him up, doesn't say anything, just comes back over to our platoon. And all I was thinking to myself was, okay, message sent, message received. Shortly after that incident, and a drill sergeant from the 2nd Platoon challenged the Nebraska Platoon to a tackle football game. The football game was a great way for us to do something physical without actually getting into fist fights with these guys. So it's kind of where we really showed how much more we were a team than the other platoons. And, and, and then, of course, we would, we would just kill them. We had really, we had some Division I athletes and, uh, and, and we were a team, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And about halftime of that game, the, the second platoon drill sergeant said, you know, I think we're going to stop this before somebody gets seriously injured. Sergeants were getting concerned with too many injuries from other platoons and announced it was time to quit fighting the Nebraska platoon at every turn. It was time to start treating them as damn good soldiers in the company. The other platoons started to respect the Nebraska men 
Friendships were formed and the fighting came to an end. The other platoons soon came around to the fact that they were all part of a company of platoons and having the Nebraska platoon made the company stronger. There was one part of the test that remained and that was advanced military training, which included tanks, how to drive them, how to shoot them, and how to stay safe and work as a team in them. When the Nebraska platoon went to the tank training part, they learned the crew duties of a 52-ton tank. In the crew of a 52-ton tank, there are four crew members. There's a driver, motor, gunner, and tank commander. The tank commander is in charge of the tank. When the tank commander gives the fire command, he announces what kind of round to put down range. In doing so, the gunner will index the proper round of the computer, which enhances the ballistic reticle for that round to be used. We'll load the proper round out of the honeycomb into the gun tube and announce up, meaning he's clear of the recoil path. Drop it into the cradle, just like this. Lay it on the snub base, line it up, just make a fist. Like this, and reel the river to gun fire. Things aren't safe, ain't nothing gonna happen to you. All right, make a fist. Drive that home. Now, get out of the path of recoil. All right, cross your arms, whatever you do, get out of the way, look at the ammo door. All right, stay back, hunker in the corner. So I guarantee you when that bad boy fires for the first time, if you're in the way, you wish you were out of the way. The Nebraska platoon won all 10 tank table tests and remained undefeated. Then there was knowledge of battle tactics and identifying enemy planes, tanks, and ships. Since most of the Nebraska men were in college or heading to college, the competitive beatdown was even worse in this section, and they won the last seven tests. The Nebraska platoon had done the impossible, winning 38 out of 38 tests throughout the summer. That is, is pretty phenomenal. I mean, we outperformed, this Nebraska platoon outperformed every single category or vertical in the U.S. Army at Fort Knox, Kentucky in 1979. We outshot everybody. Uh, we, uh, athletes, good athletes, collegiate athletes, state championship athletes, smart guys, it really had successful careers. And I think that's what it's all about, protecting your country, protecting your family. And just like that, they were awarded honor platoon and graduation. Big Jim had the responsibility of giving the men their certificates since he put the whole platoon together and showed the military how his plan of college incentives can grow the military. Big Jim's father-in-law, Monty Kiffin, a World War II veteran, also had the chance to see the ceremony. Fifty young men left for basic training in May, and fifty hardened soldiers came home 90 days later. Many of this platoon got back together in Lexington, Nebraska, to reflect on the whole experience. Here are a few of their thoughts on what this experience did for them, and why the Nebraska platoon excelled. Well, it makes you grow up, I guess. Um, I mean, it makes a man out of you from when you just graduated from high school, go to basic training. Um, I had an instance where my father was in the hospital for like four months before I left, so, you know, I didn't really know, know much about life. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, away from home a whole lot. And <clears throat> being away from them, and my mom was with him. I stayed with some friends for those four months, and then I went to basic training, and from then on, you know, I just, you know, just kind of ran me into a, a whole person, and and I, uh, went on, like I said, and, and made a career out of it for 26 years, and ended up overseas. So that's probably my experience. There wasn't a whole hell of a lot when I got back from basic training that I didn't feel I couldn't do. Well, it made me realize how good. Nebraska was, seeing other parts of the United States and, and so forth. And uh, I had met a tremendous amount of friends. Um, I got to know the Murphys and Big Jim, and uh, I'm very blessed for that. I've said this many times, it's the most pivotal experience of my life. Because this basic that we did together tested me mentally, physically, like no, nothing else ever did in my life. So everything else, every other challenge that came after that was relatively easy. Med school, residency, all that stuff. A lot of people had trouble with that. 
and I'm not saying it wasn't easy, the road was, was, that it was easy, it was not. But having gone through this experience, it was like, hey, I can do this. this. I think this just made us better though. It allowed some guys to have that self-confidence to go one step further, right? It allowed, you know, guys go to law school, guys go to medical school. It, it allowed them to do that because they could get their tuition paid, but also gave them the self-confidence. Yeah, I can do that. So I think we'd have been, I think the guys would have been in good shape anyway, but I think this helped them go from maybe pretty good to great. My dad, Big Jim, who we've mentioned before, he believed in his product, and his product was the military. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, anything you go into, it was going to allow a young man or a young woman to gain some confidence, to uh, learn how to do some things, to meet some people, to learn what teamwork is like. Um, that experience is going to help any young person. Well, I just tell Big Jim, thanks. Thanks for a great summer and a great life. Joe Kelly went on to get his law degree and become the United States Attorney for Nebraska. Scott Hofferper runs a major hospital for Banner Health and Mark Catterson, a doctor. The rest became teachers, principals, electricians, firemen, and strong members of their community. While David Zlakowski, Leon Haith, and Jim Murphy stayed in for over 20 years and went on to serve in Iraq. A great, uh, a great visit here at the museum in Lexington, Nebraska, my hometown. Not far from one day I'll be buried, but uh, thank you. Well, I'm a mighty, mighty man. I'm young and I'm in my prime. Yes, I'm a mighty, mighty man. I'm young and I'm in my prime. Well, I don't pick my jobs. I'm ready for any old kind. Yes, I'm a real young man, a brand new 25. Yes, I'm a real young man, a brand new 25. Well, I'm willing, I'm able, I'm frantic, much alive. Well, I'm six feet tall, I ain't no hand-me-down. Yes, I'm six feet tall and I ain't no hand-me-down. Well, I got a gal in town who calls me. We doing so well, so many other things. Even some of the other drill sergeants wanted us to fail. And about every now and then they would do surprise searches with German shepherds. And these German shepherds would just go wall locker, wall locker, look and see if somebody had drugs, right? And this guy from the third platoon was in charge of it. And by the time he got to the third floor, right, everybody thought it was going to be clean. And then he goes over to Steve Blocker's area. The dog just starts barking. He goes, I told you these guys, they can't be this clean. It's not possible, right? It's right there in that radiator. And they pulls the radiator up, and Steve Blocker had hid some Oreo cookies in the radiator. He loved Oreo cookies, and they were illegal to have. The guy goes, the guy literally just goes, oh my God, these guys have Oreo cookies instead of drugs. <laughs> There's these two hills called misery and agony but they're hill they're called that because you usually you had to walk up them or run up them during the day and they were steep hills and it caused you problems but we had gone out on uh for our uh, overnight bivouac is what they call it in the old days and uh but then we were doing the move during night so we're marching with our weapons and we're going down down uh the hill and dan who's definitely afraid of snakes so, and he was at the beginning. Now, this is, I'm going to go because back. Because I was a squad leader. Because of the squad leader. He's a squad leader. Now, uh, because he had recruited some people. I'm not sure it was because he was a good squad leader. It was because he had recruited some other people into the platoon. Sorry, that's semantics. <laughs> but anyway, he he comes up. He, think, he, he sees a snake. He jumps over the snake and yells, oh, snake. But, he, but when he does that, somehow he trips and falls. But since he was the first one there and it was at night and it was, was dark, uh, then I he wasn't fell. taking part in the, the uh, marching. So. The whole 
Drill Sergeant Gwill wanted me to do his laundry for him, so he asked me if I knew how to do laundry. So I said, sure. I had no, I had no clue. I'd never done laundry, but I said, whatever. So he gives me his laundry. I go down, throw all his laundry um, in the washing machine, and uh, didn't separate anything. And it gets done, and I pull it out, and he had his softball uniform in there. It was white with pinstripes, and it washed it with his red, I don't know, T-shirt, shorts, whatever, and it came out, and it was bright pink. I didn't remember that till now. Yeah, and he shows up and he's like, he's looking at it and he's like, what did you do? So we tried to bleach it, couldn't get it bleached. And he had a game that night. So we threw it in the dryer to try and get it dried in time. And we couldn't get it dry. So he ends up having to go play softball. Not only is his white uniform pink, it's still soaking wet from not getting it dried. So that's my best moment. Perfect. Uh, I recall a story about being on KP duty. I had a relatively easy job swatting flies initially. Of course, I got caught talking with somebody, so I got busted from that to pots and pan <laughs> detail with Sid German. It was a terrible job. It was hot. There was a ton of pots and pans. Didn't think we'd ever get through with them. But of course, Sid, he's got to start screwing around some way. He's got to find some activity in this that's amusing. So he takes off my hat, throws it in the water. I take off his hat, throw it in the water. And we gradually up the ante. He starts throwing saucepans full of water at me. I throw <laughs> saucepans full of water at him. He eventually fills up a like a 10 gallon pot of water. And I see him coming at me with the thing out of the corner of my eyes and get out of the way just in time. But he gets me completely wet from the waist down. Just floods the floor of the kitchen. The mess sergeant comes back there and is incensed. What's going on back here? I said, Sarge, I think that drain over there is backed up. <laughs> and he bought it. <laughs> okay, great. You guys are done. <laughs> Yay!